Okay. Good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, please make sure that your screen is on mute. Mr. Danny Dayan, Chairman of Yad Vashem, Prize donors, Mr. and Mrs. Brian and Lee Joffe, Yad Vashem Prize Committee members, prize recipients, Professor Eliana Adler and Dr. Leon Saltiel, and members of the Joffe family. Ladies and gentlemen, shalom and welcome. We've gathered this afternoon for the Yad Vashem International Book Prize Award Ceremony for 2021. Yad Vashem awarded its first book prize in 1988, prior to the establishment of the International Institute for Holocaust Research. Past recipients include Professor Saul Friedlander, Christopher Brown, Jan Grabowski, and the late David Cesarini. In 1993, Yad Vashem established the International Institute for Holocaust Research as an academic unit to encourage, promote, and expand research in the field of Holocaust studies. The Institute is now firmly established as a world leader in scholarship, developing and coordinating international research, planning and undertaking scholarly projects, organizing academic symposia and international conferences, fostering cooperative projects among research institutions, supporting young scholars who research the Holocaust and publishing analytical studies, conference proceedings, documents and monographs on the Holocaust, and of course, awarding an annual book prize for path-breaking research. In 2018, the first Yad Vashem book prize in memory of Benny and Tilly Jaffe was awarded to Dr. Daniel Reiser and Dr. Jan Popper. In 2019, it was awarded to Professor Omer Bartov and Professor Joanna Tokarska-Bakir. In 2020, it was awarded to Professor Johannes Dieter Steinert and Dr. Avraham Allen Rosen. I would like to invite Mr. Danny Dayan, Chairman of Yad Vashem, to speak. Thank you so much, sir. When I see those pictures of the previous, uh, uh, previous year's uh, award ceremony, I become even more frustrated by the fact that we have to do it once again by uh, Zoom, by uh, virtual methods, and uh, I, cannot, I don't have the privilege uh, to see in person uh, all the guests, uh, the recipients of the prize, uh, and uh, uh, the Jaffe family. I hope that next year we will be able to do it in a, in a, in a normal way as we were used uh, years ago. Um, first of all, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, Brian and Lee Brian and Lee Joffe for uh, uh, making this uh, award possible uh, for their Shem friendship for Yad Vashem that uh, is not uh, limited to this award. Uh, uh, and it has uh, many facets that we appreciate uh, very much. Again, uh, I am eager to, to see you in person and I, I hope that we will do it uh, uh, very, very soon. Um, I am... Um, I think that the two academics and the two books that uh, we uh, give today to them this uh, prize uh, in the memory of uh, Brian's uh, parents um, are different and are similar. They are different in many aspects. Uh, one deals with an Ashkenazi community, the other uh, deals with a Sephardic community. Uh, one deals with persons that uh, mainly survived the, the, the Holocaust. Uh, 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 the other uh, uh, deals with a community that uh, was totally decimated uh, during the Shoah. Uh, but uh, uh, in that sense, uh, it is very relevant that these two books are uh, awarded the prize because that uh, showed that we are talking about uh, one event. Uh, the Shoah is, uh, the Holocaust is one event, uh, one phenomena, uh, one tragedy that uh, had many manifestations, but uh, was united by the uh, diabolic design of uh, Nazi Germany uh, to exterminate the entire Jewish community. And I am especially happy uh, that in my first uh, 
year as uh, um, chairman of Yad Vashem and in my first award ceremony, um, we honor uh, these two uh, outstanding academics, Eliana Adler and Leon Saltier. Um, I uh, will not have the chutzpah uh, to uh, say that uh, I uh, can, uh, I am the person that can uh, evaluate their academic um, achievements, but I definitely, uh, I am happy that these two uh, uh, persons received the award because they both, both Eliana and Leon, had uh, manifested uh, their uh, Jewish pride. Um, uh, not only in uh, their books, not only in their academic endeavors, but also in other ways. Uh, Eliana did it recently uh, when uh, she decided to uh, reject an honor that was bestowing her over her because uh, she thought that uh, those that uh, bestow the honor upon her are not worth uh, uh, to uh, be honored themselves in, uh, in, in, in light of their uh, attitude towards uh, Holocaust research. And Leon uh, had an outstanding, uh, out of, uh, uh, his outside the academy uh, uh, career also in uh, important Jewish organizations like the World Jewish Congress and UN Watch, in which again, uh, uh, showing their uh, backbone as, uh, as in, in Jewish advocacy was an integral part of uh, his and her personality. Uh, so a person, as a person that uh, also made uh, some effort to contribute in that respect, I uh, feel uh, very close to both of you, Eliana and Leon, and I'm very glad that you are the recipients of the 2021 uh, Joffe Award. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Dayan. Um, I'd like to invite Professor Dan Michman, head of the International Institute for Holocaust Research and incumbent of the John Nyman Chair for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem, as well as Professor Emeritus um, of the Department of Jewish History and Contemporary Jewry at Bar Ilan University. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, Mr. Danny Dayan, our new chairman. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Brian and Lee Joffe, members and friends of the Joffe family, uh, my colleagues, Professor Dina Poat and Dr. Yael Nidam Orvieto, the prize recipients, uh, Professor Eliana Adler, <clears throat> who was also a fellow at our institute in the, in the past, and later Dr. Leon Sheltiel, with whom we also have contacts for uh, many, many years, and uh, the many Zoom attendants. <clears throat> I'm glad to welcome you all to the awarding event of uh, the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for the year 2021. As was said by our Master of Ceremony, Sir Brightman, the book prize is awarded by now for already a considerable number uh, of years. It isn't an easy task for the committee members to read and evaluate a variety of books in a variety of languages and on a broad array of topics. Indeed, we consult uh, experts and exchange views among us. We always have two leading foreign scholars on the committee in order to have an input from people with different perspectives. Each year the foreign scholars are different ones and we are most grateful to their readiness to join us, mastering a series of books within three to four months and evaluating them. This year, we had the honor to have two longtime acquaintances on the committee, uh, Professor Conrad Kvit from Australia, who was born uh, during the Holocaust in 1941 in Nazi Germany. And we congratulate him from here also on his 80th birthday, which he celebrated with his family several months ago. Conrad is a prolific scholar who also served as, as an expert to prosecution authorities who put wartime uh, criminals on trial. The other foreign member is Privat Dozent Dr. Susanna Heim, with whom Yad Vashem cooperates in various ways already for more than a quarter century. 
and she was also a fellow at our institute. She belongs to a generation of German scholars who introduced a major change in German Holocaust historiography and uh, recently completed overseeing, coordinating and contributing to the 16 volume series, The Persecution and Murder of the European Jews by Nazi Germany, which compiled more than 5,000 annotated documents on the Holocaust. This series, originally in German, is now translated into English jointly uh, with Yad Vashem. The fact that international scholars are ready to join our Book Prize Committee each year points to the international standing that this book prize has gained and to Yad Vashem's international prestige. I want to thank <coughs> Brian and Lee Joffrey from the depth of my heart for enabling us to continue this important project and do it in memory of uh, Benny and Tilly Joffrey Zechonam Livracha. It's part of our effort to keep Yad Vashem's leading place at the front of Holocaust research. Last but not least, of course, I want to congratulate the recipients of the prize, Mazel Tov. <clears throat> so the, the Zoom is yours. Thank you, Professor Michman. Since 2018, the Yad Vashem Book Prize has been awarded in memory of Benny and Tilly Joffe, thanks to the generosity of their son, Brian, his wife, Lee, and their family. Tilly Joffe, nay Weinstein, was born in a small village called Balninka in Lithuania. She came to South Africa with her parents when she was four years old. They lived in the suburb of Mayfair in Johannesburg. Benny Joffe was born in Potchefstroom in South Africa to parents who came from Zagare in Lithuania. After he finished school, he left for Johannesburg where he met Tilly. They were married in 1946. Both Tilly and Benny lost relatives during the Holocaust. In the catalog produced for the exhibition entitled Art from the Holocaust, 100 works from the Yad Vashem collection, which was held in Berlin in 2016 at the German Historical Museum, there is an article about Tilly's first cousin, Benzion or Nolik Schmidt, who was burnt to death age 80, age 19 in the Kovno ghetto. Nolik's sole remaining painting which you can see projected on the screen, is housed in Yad Vashem's art collection. The Joffies have four sons, Brian, Stanley, Selwyn, and Leon. Leon. Brian now lives primarily in Israel, and his brothers all live in the United States. In the mid-90s, Benny and Tilly moved to Atlanta so they'd be able to spend more time with their children and grandchildren. Tilly and Benny were involved in Jewish community affairs. Benny was the chairman of his local synagogue and the president of Beaconsfield Country Club. Tilly was also involved in Jewish affairs. As a young girl, she joined the Haponim Youth Movement and later became a member of Witzo. She was the chairperson of Witzo Johannesburg and after emigrating to the States, she started Witzo activity in Atlanta. Benny was a businessman and together with his brother-in-law, Benny Weinstein, they established and ran a company called Tested Rice, which is a household brand in South Africa. They were also involved in a rice mill in Haifa. Tilly was the matriarch of the family and always would always host large family gatherings at their home on weekends and Jewish holidays. She always cared for everyone in the family and was particularly fond of their Israeli family and loved to keep in touch with them even though they were far away. Tilly passed away in 2011 at the age of 90, and Benny passed away in 2016 at the age of 95. They're greatly missed. I would like to call on Mr. Brian Joffe to give the Joffe family address. Hello, all. I'm not very good at making speeches and quite intimidating uh, talking to such a distinguished audience, but let's do my best. Mr. Dani Dayan, Chairman of Yad Vashem, Professor Michman, Head of Yad Vashem International Institute for Holocaust Research, distinguished guests, award winners, family and friends, all protocols observed. It's extremely difficult to philosophize about the Holocaust and its tragic events. The sensitivity of those traumatic events, even though they occurred nearly 90 years ago, is still very raw. Its magnitude has left no one 
with any rational when formed reason as to why it happened. If you're a believer, which I am, I'm convinced that one day we will establish a reason as to why Hashem allowed something so awful as this to have happened. Reality is it did happen no matter what the reason. The internet describes Yad Vashem as a memorial and a monument to those who perished in the Holocaust. By definition, this is a recognition of an event that happened in the past. Yad Vashem, in my opinion, stands for more than a monument of the terrible events of the Holocaust. It represents the very DNA and the existence of Israel and the Jewish people, both in Israel and in the diaspora. It also recognizes the right of Jews to coexist with all societies in, in the world at large. It's the glue that holds us all together. It recognizes those who stand for justice and conscience. Yad Vashem is the custodian of the events of the Holocaust and also served as a formula and foundation for the state of Israel. The Holocaust did not dif differentiate on the standing of its victims, nor their wealth, nor be all belongings. It consumed all, a lesson that we as Jews are one nation with only one future. If we are to survive, we can't forget from where we have come and plan collectively to where we are going. The vision is the formula for defeat. The book prize makes current events, makes, makes the, the book prize makes current the events of the past. New information and new factual stories continually breathe life and hope into the tragedy of the past. It renews the reasons for the establishment of Yad Vashem in the first place. The Torah tells us that one should honor one's parents in life and in death. The recognition of Yisko each year brings back to life the memories of the good times with good times spent with parents, also the tough times. The continued remembrance of, of parents brings to life the bond which exists with one's parents, even though they may not be physically here. For me, the past is the present and its continued memory is the future too. I'd like to thank all those who played a role in my life and that and that of my family. Those who created memories and the blueprint of how to live the future. On behalf of myself and my wife, Lee, may Yad Vashem and all who it represent be blessed and may the Jewish nation prosper and in time be freed from the sad burden of the past. Tonight, as we honor the winners, we also remember my parents, Benny and Tilly Joffe, who committed significant part of their lives to Judaism and to Zionism. To all the winners, congratulations, and thank you for being, bringing Yad Vashem and what it stands for to life. L'chaim. Right, thank you so much for those very insightful and moving words. Um, folks, before we continue with the awards, a short musical interlude for violin and piano performed by Tanya Belster on violin and Orpha Shelley on piano. They're part of the Atar Trio. We will listen to a piece by Ernst Bloch entitled Vidui for Confession.
Thank you, Tanya and Ophir. This year, the members of the prize committee have decided to award the Yad Vashem International Book Prize to two scholars, Professor Eliano R. Adler for her book, Survival on the Margins, Polish Jewish Refugees in the Wartime Soviet Union, published by Harvard University Press in 2020. And to Dr. Leon Saltiel for his book, The Holocaust in Thessaloniki, Reactions to the Anti-Jewish Persecution, 1942 to 1943, published by Routledge in 2020. I invite Professor Dan Mechman to read the considerations of the prize committee for Professor Eliana Adler. Okay, ready? The field of Holocaust studies is broad and encompasses more than the core period of 1933 through 1945. And the geographical boundaries of territories controlled by Nazi Germany and its allies during the war. There are several circles that surround the core, which are part and parcel of the total picture. One of them comprises the refugees who fled mainly westwards before World War II began, and to a large extent to the Soviet Union after the war broke out in September 1939. Eliana Adler's book, Survival on the Margins, Polish Jewish Refugees in the Wartime Soviet Union, is dedicated to the complex subject of the Polish refugees who survived the Holocaust in the Soviet interior. Professor Adler begins with a detailed look at the process through which Polish Jews found themselves in the United, in Soviet Union. Thereafter, the path that their lives took is described in five chapters. This path was rather arduous the flight from the Nazis in the first month of World War II, the need to adapt to the peculiar Soviet conditions. For many of them, the deportation to the Gulag, to the camps, or to special settlements, followed by their release after the signing of the sikorsky maisky Agreement in August 1941, and life in the Soviet interior with all its attendant hardships and deprivations. They were repatriated to Poland after World War II ended in Europe and forced to acclimatize to the new, often hostile Polish environment, with many of them settling in the recently annexed German territories. After passing through displaced person camps, they finally emigrated to mandatory Palestine, Israel, United States, Canada, and other countries. Such is the aggregate biography of the average Polish Jewish refugee, whom the author examines in detail at every stage of his or her journey. Nevertheless, Professor Adler avoids an oversimplified view, holding the justified belief that each life story is unique and that general historical platitudes cannot encapsulate the full wealth of the historical data. Like the scholars of previous decades, such as Josef Litvak, she draws mostly on memoirs as she herself points out in the foreword. However, what sets her monograph apart from those earlier works is the greater elaboration on the general historical context, Polish, Soviet, and Jewish, as well as the history of the Holocaust. Her engagement with the memoiristic literature is much more critical. She employs new methods of working with such sources and discusses some unexplored subjects such as, such as gender. Professor Adler is fully aware of and takes care to emphasize the twin aspects of any memoir, the biographical and factual and the imaginary. 
in which the writers filter their life story through the prism of their subsequent views, harmonizing the events of the past with their personal preferences and with the preferred historical narrative of the group to which they belong. As a result, the individual accounts often reflect group stereotypes. She emphasizes that the Polish Jewish refugees were primarily overseen by the state security services in the Soviet Union and laments the fact that neither the Russian Federation nor most of the other successor states for the, to the Soviet Union have been willing to grant access to these records in spite of her efforts to convince archivists in the former Soviet Union that a study can cause no harm. Professor Adler points to the state of historiographical research on the Holocaust in which the topic of the Polish Jewish refugees has remained insufficiently studied because of the emphasis on the victims of the Holocaust, even though the number of Polish Jews who lived through the war in the, in the Soviet Union was much greater than the number of the survivors. And it was the former who went on to shape post-war Polish uh, Jewish life. The picture painted by the author is well balanced. She rightly shuns the common depiction of Polish Jewish life in the USSR as one filled with unremitting suffering, almost on par with Jewish life under Nazi occupation. And she takes pain, pains to spell out the paradoxical conclusion that despite all the difficulties of Soviet life and even the death of some of the Jews, the deportation to the Gulag ultimately saved the lives of many Polish Jews. Moreover, she points out that not all the Jews passed through the Gulag. Some of them had accepted Soviet citizenship back in 1940, and the rest, with very few exceptions, took this step in January 1943. Thus, she lessens the heroic, naive pathos in the history of the Polish Jewish re refugees. At the same time, she maintains that most of the Polish refugees who accepted Soviet citizenship in 1940 failed to escape the Nazis a second time because of the Soviet evacuation policy, among other reasons, and ended up being murdered. Professor Adler also avoids a streamlined and simplified interpretation of the contribution of the Polish Jews to the national awakening of their Soviet counterparts. Finally, she makes it clear that the attitude of the Soviet authorities toward the Polish Jewish refugees was no different than their attitude toward all Polish citizens. By contrast, the wartime history of the Jews and the Poles, including their recruitment into Anders army and Berling's army, and their lives in post-war Poland was different, as is the contemporary Polish memory of these two groups. Professor Ada has completed an impressive project which makes a most important contribution to Holocaust scholarship by pre presenting a sensitive picture of the fate of those who survived on the Soviet margins. It is the first book-length study of how Polish Jewish refugees managed to survive the war in the Soviet Union. It tells their story from a people-centered perspective. This focuses on dilemmas, challenges, and individual fates in the context of the policies of Nazi Germany and of the Stalinist state. In view of the merits of this important study, the International Committee for the Yad Vashem Book Prize decided to award the 2021 prize to Professor Eliana Adler. And on the prize committee were uh, Professor <coughs> uh, uh, Dr. Susanne Heim, uh, Professor Konrad Kvit, Dr. Yael Nidam Orvieto, Professor Dina Porat, and myself, your humble servant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mishman. Um, I now invite Professor Eliana Adler to speak about her book, Survival on the Margins, Polish Jewish Refugees in the Wartime Soviet Union. Thank you very much, Don, for the really wonderful introduction. And of course, for this recognition for my book, the list of books uh, that have previously received this award is truly august, and I'm moved and honored that my book will join them. I should also note that a year of research at Yad Vashem was critical for this project, and it feels particularly meaningful to receive this award. I only wish I could be with you all in person. My sincere gratitude goes to the Jaffe family, 
for their generous contributions and also to the staff of Yad Vashem for everything that they do. And as uh, Dani Dayan alluded to, um, th this has been a uh, sort of troubling uh, award season for me. And so once again, um, this is so very uh, meaningful. Conceptualizing this enormous project has been greatly aided by ongoing scholarly conversations. I was very fortunate that around the same time that I started this project, a cohort of other scholars also began to explore related issues. And over the ensuing years, we have been on numerous um, conference panels together. We've read each other's works. We've edited volumes. We've created other fora for speaking together. Um, and that has been so useful and important to me. I'm very impressed by what all of these other scholars have created and so thankful that we could help one another to make sense of these multifaceted stories. And as always, I am grateful to my family for support and humor and reading my proofs. Before I start discussing the content of this book, I want to make just a few, um, um, just a couple of notes about the structure and the sources and method. Uh, and this is something that Don Michman um, alluded to as well. Uh, when I started this project, I thought it was going to be entirely archivally based. And of course, I did visit archives all over the world and find a lot of useful information. But the more research that I did, the more I became convinced that the most essential insights, really the driving force of the narrative, actually came from the testimonial sources, from oral histories and published and unpublished testimonies and uh, memoirs. So this insight changed the book. Um, the trajectory of the book in numerous ways. And I think the most important one is that it became to a great deal about choice, about looking at decisions and agency that was available to this particular group. In both um, the way they tell their stories and the way their stories unfolded. So survival on the margins, Polish Jewish refugees in the wartime Soviet Union traces the history and the memory of a group of Polish Jews who survived the Second World War in the unoccupied regions of the USSR. Because this path of survival was so convoluted and involved so much movement, history took up most of the book and will be mostly what I'll speak of today. Um, but I do want to say that it, it, even though it takes up less space, memory is no less important for how we think about uh, this story of survival. In September of 1939, Poland was torn asunder by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Polish Jews on both sides of the new border faced a choice, the first major choice in this book. And as human nature dictates, most of them stayed in their homes with their support systems, with their property, with their social capital. A relatively small number of the largest Jewish community in Europe made the decision to uproot their lives and to cross the new border from the Nazis to the Soviets. Um, numbers offered have ranged from as many as 500,000 to perhaps as few as 100,000, but certainly a significant number. And what we do know for sure is that they continued crossing the border back and forth. They went back to get goods. They went back to get other people to join them, or they left because they didn't like what they experienced. So there was a great deal of border crossing. The lands annexed to the USSR as Western Ukraine and Western Belarus, as well as their resident and refugee population underwent rapid Sovietization in the next year. Property and businesses were nationalized. Schools had to function in Ukrainian and Belarusian instead of Polish. Churches, synagogues, and social organizations were closed. 
the leaders of political organizations as well as police and army officers were arrested. The NKVD, the Soviet secret police, established itself in the region. The residents of the new territory became automatic Soviet citizens. Meanwhile, in the spring of 1940, Stalin provided a test for the refugees, those who had crossed the border voluntarily. They could accept a modified Soviet citizenship or elect to return to Nazi-held formerly Polish regions. Most of the refugees, exhausted from living in overcrowded synagogues, unable to find work, and disturbed by the growing interference of the state, opted for return to their homes. However, this choice only demonstrated their ingratitude and un untrustworthiness to Stalin, who decided instead to deport them to special settlements deep in the Soviet interior. There they would be forced to engage in hard labor as a form of punishment and re-education. When the deportation trains dropped them off in isolated camps, where they would be expected to chop down trees or perform other forms of labor well beyond their previous experience as largely urban, white and blue collar workers, they were told that they would never be released. The deportees suffered from malnutrition, vitamin deficiencies, on the job accidents and lack of access to medical care. Winter conditions were truly horrific and they were still expected to work out of doors. They thought this was the end of their lives. Then quite unexpectedly, in July and August of 1941, they were freed. Following the surprise German invasion of the USSR from a position of weakness, Stalin agreed to free all Polish citizens and allow them to form an army under allied command. The so-called amnesty provided the refugees, come deportees, with yet another decision. Should they stay in their special settlements or try and find better conditions elsewhere in Soviet territory? Most opted to head south towards Central Asia, where they hoped to find warmer climates and better access to food. Instead, they found tremendous overcrowding as millions of Soviet citizens evacuated to these same regions to avoid the rapidly advancing front. In addition, they found many compatriots and they were able to settle often with family members or friends from their hometowns. These Polish Jews spent the rest of the war struggling to survive in Central Asian locales. The first year was the hardest. They found it nearly impossible to secure work and housing. Food and medical care were requisitioned by the military. Some of the refugees died of starvation and contagious diseases. Over time, however, they learned to manage in the Soviet system and found more secure living arrangements. Some of the Polish Jews joined units of the Red Army. A smaller number deployed with the Polish Army units evacuated via Iran. Most stayed in the rear, where they learned of the progress of the war and evidence of atrocities only piecemeal. As the Red Army pushed on and liberated parts of Poland, they began to try to contact their relatives and slowly learned more about the destruction. They would not understand the totality of the genocide until they returned to Poland as part of a 1946 repatriation. On their return, the refugees came face to face with the devastation in Poland and had to decide whether to try to stay and rebuild some semblance of Jewish life that had existed before the war or to become refugees once again. Post-war Poland was rapidly coming under Soviet hegemony. For some, this offered the promise of a future of equality without anti-Semitism and with a chance to reestablish Jewish communal life, cultural life in Poland. For others, the previous six to seven years under Soviet communist had been more than enough, communism that is. Back in Poland, the refugees also met the surviving remnant, the Sheiris Hapleta or the Sheirita Pleta of Polish Jewry, those who had faced the Holocaust there. These two groups of survivors merged into a single unit, marrying one another, re reforming families and communities and facing daunting decisions about the future. Many elected to stay in Poland, 
They moved in particular to the larger cities such as Warsaw and Łódź, as well as to the so-called recovered territories of Lower Silesia. They produced poetry and other writings on the war and on their bright future as well as finding work and continuing their educations. The majority of Polish Jews, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust and of the war in the Soviet Union left. They relocated first to the displaced persons camps in the American and British zones. And from there eventually to Israel, the United States, Canada, Australia, and other places that would accept them. And this brings us finally to the topic of memory. In their encounter with the Holocaust and its few survivors, the refugees from the USSR came to understand that their own sufferings were minor in comparison. The contingency and the irony of their survival as a result of Soviet deportation also became clear. In this, they differed from the Polish Jews who had stayed behind, yet the losses of the Holocaust were their own. They left behind homes, families, communities, and towns. They lost brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, teachers and students. In the years following the war, most of the survivors dedicated themselves to their families and their professions. For those who had survived in the USSR, it was yet another new beginning from scratch. They also devoted energy and resources to memorial projects in the form of books and monuments to their lost civilization. What came to be known as the Holocaust was their common focus. The parallel experience of survival in the USSR faded into the shadows. Part of the purpose of this book is to shine light on this adjacent Holocaust experience and to consider how it might be integrated into the narrative of Jewish life and death during the Second World War. The refugees began the war amidst Polish Jewry. Along with other Polish Jews, they experienced the German invasion and considered whether or not to flee. At the time, no one could have imagined how momentous this decision actually was. They hoped the war would end soon and that they could re be reunited with their loved ones. The Holocaust itself was still developing and had not yet reached its most terrifying and destructive phase. However, as a result of this decision, often made in haste and always without foreknowledge, the majority of Polish Jewish survivors of the war essentially disappeared from both history and memory. By the time they returned and were reintegrated into what remained of Polish Jew Jewish society, their own stories of survival were marginalized by those of the Holocaust. This situation continued as the Holocaust and war refugees jointly built communities and memorial cultures around the world. The book concludes by asking what it might look like to include their experiences in our historical and memorial projects. What would it mean to expand the compass of survival to include this group? I hope that this brief overview, at the very least, encourages listeners to learn more about the Polish Jewish refugees and their survival experiences in the USSR. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor Adler. And now we'll listen to On Wings of Song by Felix Mendelssohn, performed by Ofer Shelley and Tanya Belzer. <laughs>
Thank you once again. Um, I would like to invite Professor Dan Mechman to read the considerations of the Prize Committee for Dr. Leon Saltiel. The genocidal chapter of the Holocaust hit the Jewish community throughout Europe, yet not with the same intensity. The percentage of the Jews from Thessaloniki or Salonika who perished was one of the highest, approximately, approximately 95%. One of the earliest studies in the field of Holocaust research dealt with this history on the basis of the sources which were available in the public domain at the time. This was the path-breaking book by Michael Molcho and Yosef Mechama in memoriam, Homage aux Victimes Juives de Nazi Angres, uh, published in Salonika in 1948. The Hebrew edition, <coughs> Shoat Yehudei Yavan, was published by Yad Vashem in 1965. Yet, for a variety of reasons, the political situation and the limited access to archival material in Greece, among other reasons, Scholarly research on the topic in the following four decades was scarce. However, a new phase began at the end of the 1980s and a series of important studies have been published in various languages. A new generation of Holocaust scholars with a fresh perspective has emerged in recent years and more archival and oral sources have become accessible, which has given this research an additional impetus. Leon Saltiel's penetrating study, The Holocaust in Thessaloniki, Reactions to the Anti-Jewish Persecutions, 1942, 1943, which is based on his PhD dissertation, stands out as one of the finest examples of this new phase of research. Dr. Saltiel's book focuses mainly on the attitudes and behavior of the local Greek Christian elites vis-a-vis -vis the plight of the local Jews who, until that moment, constituted an important demographic, economic, and cultural component of the city. This perspective fits in the larger context of recent studies in Holocaust research that examine the multifaceted role of the locals in the theater of persecution. Dr. Saltiel uses a micro-historical approach to examine this aspect, as well as the actions of the Jews themselves, thus providing an integrated narrative. He first investigates the extent of local knowledge about the extermination of the European Jews based on reports in underground and collaborationist publications during the deportation month. In, it turns out that the non-Jews knew a great deal and that the information to which they had access was quite accurate, definitely in 1943, when the Salonican Jews were deported. Dr. Saltillo also found 52 letters written by mothers in Thessaloniki to their sons in Athens, Jewish ones, which indicate that even though they lacked all the accurate knowledge, they very much sensed the extreme precariousness and historical meaning of the situation. However, beyond that, the fact is that Christians continued to live in the Jewish ghettos and thus witnesses the harsh fate of the local Jews, even if they did not know their final fate. All in all, the Christian neighbors, first and foremost, knew enough to have been prompted to act. Against this background, Dr. Saltiel then examines the attitudes and actions of the city authorities, of the church, the courts, and local university, of professional associations, of the Red Cross representatives, and of the local Jews themselves in both Thessaloniki and Athens. Following a thorough and well-documented examination, Dr. Saltiel concludes that, and I quote, the Jews were mostly met with neglect, indifference, and worse, hostility by the state and city authorities and their colleagues and partners for many years. That's a quote from page 211. The church had a mixed record. Amazingly, more efforts were made by various actors in Athens to save Thessalonican Jews than in Thessaloniki itself. Anti-Semitism did exist in Greece, but not as flagrantly as in Nazi Germany and some other countries. However, the legacy of the Turkish millet system prompted the majority to view the Jews as alien and not as compatriots, and thus to show no interest in the fate of the Jews due to political and material self-interest. This had a significant impact on the limited rescue efforts. The wartime fate of the Salonican jury had an immensely depressing aftermath. After presenting his methodological introduction, 
Dr. Shaltiel opens the book with a chapter uh, which is an account of the destruction of the Jewish cemetery. This was not only an act of dehumanizing the dead in general, but also a symbolic act of erasing the memory of the Jewish presence in a central site in the city, which was to a considerable extent an extension of the wartime attitude and actions. In view of the important contribution that this study makes to the understanding of the Holocaust in Thessaloniki, in particular, and more broadly in Greece, which implicitly also refutes the recently promoted view that the Holocaust was essentially an Eastern European event that was part of German empire building and not a larger ideologically driven enterprise, the International Committee for the Yad Vashem Book Prize decided to award the 2021 prize to Dr. Leon Shaltiel. And again, the members of the prize committee, Dr. Susanna Heim, Professor Konrad Kvit, Dr. Jan Nidam Orvieto, Professor Dina Porat, and myself. Thank you, Professor Michman. I invite Dr. Leon Saltiel to speak about his book, The Holocaust in Thessaloniki, Reactions to the Anti-Jewish Persecution, 1942 to 1943. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Breitman. Uh, dear David and Lee Joffe and family, Chairman Danny Dayan, members of the jury, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's with great honor and humility that they accept the 2021 International Book Prize for Holocaust Research in memory of Benny and Tilly Joffe Zifanoli Vraha from Yad Vashem, a pioneering institution dedicated to safeguarding the memory of the victims of the Holocaust, documenting its dark pages and educating the future generations. So these events will never be forgotten but also never be repeated again. I would also like to sincerely congratulate my co-ORD, Dr. Eliana Adler on her book, Survival on the Margins, Polish Jewish Refugees in the Wartime Soviet Union, which helps illuminate another important chapter of the Holocaust. My book, The Holocaust in Thessaloniki, Reactions to the Anti-Jewish Persecution, 1942-1943, is the result of many years of research, including standing archives in 10 countries around the world. I started as a personal project to understand and map what happened in my native town of Thessaloniki during the Second World War, in particular with regards to its numerous and historic Jewish community. It developed into a PhD study at the University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki, Greece, academic articles, a conference presentations, newspaper interviews, and TV documentaries, with the final result, the publication of this volume by Droutledge in 2020 which is a more complete and re-edited version of my PhD. In this period, Yad Vashem was crucial in my research. As a young researcher, I was fortunate to be awarded a Yad Vashem scholarship for research for PhD students in 2012 and spent two weeks in its campus in Jerusalem, taking advantage of its vast library and archival resources. I also had the unique opportunity to seek the advice and discuss the main arguments of my thesis with Professor Dan Michman, Professor Dina Porat and Dr. David Sieberklank, who offered me pertinent guidance and their experience. My first published work, featuring Yad Vashem's prestigious journal, Yad Vashem Studies, dealt with the destruction of the Jewish cemetery of Thessaloniki, an event that took place on the eve of the deportations of the Jewish community, but was not part of a linear sequence that led to them. In fact, neither its actors nor its motivations came from Berlin. It was rather a local initiative responding to long-standing issues of the local population. Thanks to Dr. Sieberklank and the meticulous editing by the anonymous and Yad Vashem reviewers, this article was very well received and created a strong impact in Greece. It was featured in front page stories in the local press. It was further translated into Greek and French, has been extremely quoted in the scholarship. And this motivated me even more to continue this research and bring it to a full end. The Saloniki or Salonika or Saloniki was most probably the only major city in Europe with a Jewish majority. At the beginning of the 20th century, more than 50% of the population was Jewish, a reality that marked the basic character of the city. The Jews were prominent in all spheres of public, social, and economic life. And throughout the European network and through the European networks, they were the main agents of innovation, new ideas, and economic prosperity. A major center of Jewish teaching, 
Thessaloniki was running according to the Jewish calendar with everything closed on Sabbath. No wonder why some of its names include Jerusalem of the Balkans and Mother of Israel. This long and illustrious history came to an abrupt end with the deportation of the vast majority of the community, more than 90% of some 50,000 Jews in 1943. The events of the Holocaust and the Second World War in Greece have still not been properly integrated in the collective memory. Following the World War, a bloody civil war ensued where the right-wing government, supported by the British and then the Americans, fought the communists. Some of these post-war elites were wartime collaborators who could now reiterate their nationalistic credentials, fighting the communists, most of whom were in the resistance and had helped save any Jews. On the other hand, few members of the Jewish community decimated by the Holocaust decided to stay in the country, many migrating to Israel, the US or other European countries. The properties of the Jews had been given by the Germans to local custodians, some of whom may have kept them to this day, further encouraging this veil of silence. Growing up in the city as a third generation from the Holocaust, this silence was palpable. I chose to embark on the PhD project at the University in Thessaloniki, the University of Macedonia, and not outside the country, because I'm convinced that this research should be not done abroad or be part, or be part of a silo of Jewish or Holocaust studies, but rather be integrated within modern Greek history and should be the research focus of Greek academia. I would like to thank my thesis supervisor, Nikos Maranzidis, for readily accepting, supporting, and guiding me throughout the process. Along the way, I came to realize that my PhD was the first ever PhD done in a Greek university focused on the Holocaust in Greece. This thought-provoking fact is another example of how it took a long time for modern Thessaloniki to come in terms with the Jewish past. The city has been described as a city with amnesia, a city of silence, or most famously, a city of ghosts. I hope that this book will help some of these ghosts come to rest. My question is starting my research were to look deeper into what was happening in the city when the Germans decided to enforce the anti-Jewish measures. To understand that, I sought every archive contemporary to the events I could put my hands on, from the local authorities or associations, the church, foreign governments, the courts, the Red Cross, newspapers, or personal archives. I wanted to see how the city's primary institutions were reacting as the drama of the Jews was unfolding. What did they know? How did they react? What did they discuss during their meetings? The results were not at all encouraging. In terms of awareness, I was able to find instances where people accurately reported on the events and correctly analyze their tragic consequences. One would expect, as a consequence, some efforts to try to redress the situation and support the Jewish community. However, on coordinated actions against the anti-Jewish measures, other than the network of illegal adoptions of Jewish children that was able to uncover, and which was unfortunately discovered and neutralized by the Nazis, or Jewish advocacy efforts themselves, I was not able to document much else. The usual stance was that of silence, where the same organizations and individuals with whom the Jews were partners and co-citizens for decades. Their moral compass was rather disoriented and they put some other myopic interests ahead as a priority. Apart from going into depth in my research in Thessaloniki, I also sought to look into the necessary width, i.e. to see what was happening in other European cities at the time and how the local authorities were responding. This helped me realize how Thessaloniki was similar or different from other cases, and what was unique to the case I was investigating. European cities were where a considerable number of the Jewish population lived and continues to live today in the continent. Other cities have been the focus of research, and I believe that even more macrohistorical research in cities will help illuminate our knowledge further on how this strategy could unfold throughout the European continent with this urban context in mind. When I first met Professor Michman in his office in Yad Vashem, I remember vividly that he described Greece as terra incognita in terms of Holocaust research. Maybe it is the Greek language 
that makes it harder for researchers to read the primary sources or the historical works of my colleagues. Maybe it's the specificities, specificities of Greece that does not fit neither under the Western European example nor the Eastern European one, and thus does not easily fit in geographic categorizations. Or because of the rather small Jewish population, the Holocaust in Greece was not mentioned often in Holocaust commemoration events, academic conferences, or the press. I hope with my research, I've been able to provide a small contribution in order to better understand and integrate the Holocaust in Thessaloniki to the larger European picture. I also hope researchers would be inspired to look further into the Holocaust in Thessaloniki, but also in other Greek cities where such in-depth and meticulous research is still needed. Another spin-off publication of my research is the book I edited, Do Not Forget Me, Three Jewish Mothers Write to Their Sons from the Thessaloniki Ghetto, which was published in 2018 by Alexandria Publications in Greek, and this year by Berkhan Books in English. This book contains some 50 letters sent by three Jewish mothers from the ghetto of Thessaloniki to their sons who are hiding in Athens. It is a unique piece of testimony full of emotion that I discovered during my PhD research and decided that should not be, and I decided it should be a standalone publication. This book has also had a significant impact in Greece and abroad. In the last years in Greece, we have seen a resurgence of public interest vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish community and the legacy of the Holocaust. Although antisemitism regrettably remains a problem in public perceptions, the Jewish history slowly comes to the fore, where the government, local authorities, the media, and educational institutions openly speak about the past and even recognize some of these injustices. I'm hopeful that this willingness to study and commemorate this dark past has now become engraved in Greek public life and will continue for the decades to come. Before closing, let me sincerely thank Yad Vashem, the members of the jury, and the representatives of the Joffe family for this great honor. In addition, Professor Nikos Baranzidis of the University of Macedonia for supervising and guiding me during this period, as well as Professor Stratos Dordanas and Irini Lagani for being part of my advisory committee. This volume includes work I conducted during my year as a postdoctoral visiting fellow at the International History Department of the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. I would like to sincerely thank Professor David de Rodonio for giving me this opportunity. Most sincere thanks go to the Fondation pour la Mémoire de la Shoah for a generous scholarship to enable this additional research. Rutledge readily accepted to publish this book, provided careful review and editing, and supported me in its dissemination which came out in the unfortunate period of the COVID lockdowns. Special thanks go to Joe Whiting and Titanila Penzel of Routledge for patiently advising and helping me along this process. For this volume, I would like to thank Professor Kathleen Fleming of NYU for generously contributing and inspiring forward, Mario Sustiel for preparing the maps and graphs, and Dimitris Michopoulos for compiling the index. Stephen Feldman of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum kindly guided me through the process of academic publishing. Last but not least, my thanks to my family for all the love and support and all those who helped me with ideas, advice, or even had the patience to listen and discuss my findings all this time. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Saltiel. This book prize in memory of Brian's late parents, Benny and Tilly Joffe, is only feasible due to Brian and Lee Joffe's great generosity in sponsoring this prize for seven years, of which this is the fourth year. Thank you so very much, Brian and Lee. The Yad Vashem Book Prize Committee also decided to have two finalists, Bridget Ungar Klein for her book, Shatan Existence Yudhishe Ubote in Wien, 1938 to 1945, Shadow Existence of Jewish U-Boats in Vienna, 1938 to 1945, published by Pickles Fair in 2019, and Richard N. Lutkins Jr. for his book, The Not-So-Hidden Jews of Nazi Berlin, 1941 to 1945, published by Berghahn Books in 2019. The committee has also found special interest in the book by James Bernauer, Jesuit Kaddish, Jesuits, Jews, and Holocaust Remembrance, University of Notre Dame Press, 2020. One last musical interlude before we say goodnight. Yerushalayim shells the hub or Jerusalem of gold performed once again by Tanya Belzer 
and offer Shelley. Thank you very much, Tanya and Ofer. Folks, thank you for attending the 2021 award ceremony of the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for Holocaust Research in memory of Benny and Tilly Joffe. The ceremony is now concluded. We look forward to you joining us again next year. Hopefully, please God, in a post-pandemic world. Shalom and good night from Jerusalem. And Lechaim. Mazal tov to all. Onrad, Susanna, and the Joffe family, thank you very much, all. See you soon, live.